Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, please empty me of self, fill me with your Holy Spirit, and I pray that uh, everything said here and done here today will be to your honor and glory, and that you will receive all the praise, because I ask and pray these things in your sweet and holy name, Lord Jesus, and for your sake. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> and the third angel followed. Pretty easy to figure out what, what message this is. This, of course, is the third angel message of Revelation 14, 9 through 12. And I want to um, make sure that we understand how important present truth is and, and what we actually need for today. We discovered this very clearly in the first angel's message, but I thought it bared repeating again today. There are many precious truths contained in the Word of God. So there's a lot of different things in the Word of God that are precious and wonderful, but it is present truth that the flock needs now. I have seen the danger of the messengers running off from the important points of present truth to dwell upon subjects that are not calculated to unite the flock. Sanctify the soul so Satan will here take every possible advantage to in injure the cause. So we need to make sure that we're sticking with present truth. It's very, very important and um, not running off on other uh, not important topics for today. And what is exactly present truth? Well, this is pretty clearly what, it, what the present truth is, the sanctuary in connection with the 2300 days. The sanctuary is about worship. The 2300 days is the judgment hour, uh, the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. All of these aspects are contained in the three angels' messages. And, and she says here, these I have frequently seen, frequently, were the principal subjects on which the messengers should dwell. We need to be dwelling on this message in verity. Amen? And here's another uh, very pointed quote here that's very clear. The present truth for this time comprises the messages, the third angel's message succeeding the first and the second. Very clear, right? These are very, very important messages, the, the first, second, and third angel message. And where do we find it at? It's in Revelation 14, 9 through 12. So what is it about this, this third angel's message that we see that is very similar to the first angel's message? There's one word in particular that should stand out. Worship. That's right. It's worship. Worship. It's all about worship. It comes down to, do we receive the mark of the beast, which is a false worship? And, 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 and act out into a false worship, or do we worship the, the Creator God, right? Worship is the issue, the situation here in Matthew 15, 2 through 9. I'm not going to go into the whole scripture here, but the scribes and Pharisees were criticizing Christ's disciples because they had chosen to not wash their hands, and they were giving them a hard time because they weren't following their traditions. And Jesus, of course, rebuked them, and he said that they put in vain, they but in, in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. So again, it's about worship. Very, very important. Okay, the contrast and the warning between the two, true worship and the false worship, we see clearly here, to fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters, and then the false worship, if any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink the wine of wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture in the cup of his indignation. So where else do we see worship him, these similar types of, uh, this similar type of wording right here? Yes, Mike. The fourth commandment, amen? Let's compare those, these two scriptures here real quickly. Okay, so worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. And then we have in the fourth commandment, Exodus 20, 8 through 11. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is. You see? And so we see that the, the, the same type of wording, the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them, them is and rested the seventh day. So it's about worship in, in the Lord. The true worship is Sabbath, 
Saturday, seventh day of the week, worship and not the spurious Sabbath, which uh, the beast is wanting to uphold, as we'll see clear. Unfortunately for those, the outcome for the false worshipers is not very good. We see in Revelation 16, 1 and 2, that there was a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped his image. And then, of course, in Revelation 19, 20 and 21, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image, these both were cast alive, so they weren't dead already, they are alive, into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. I don't want to be in that group, do you? I'm all about doing everything that I can to be a part of the group that is saved in the, in the end, amen, and that does not get the mark of the beast and that does not uh, receive this terrible outcome of being burned in the lake of fire. So who and what is this beast exactly? Well, let's look at Revelation 13. Turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Revelation 13. Very, very common text, especially for Seventh-day Adventists. And let's just, um, let's just try to have a little bit of fun here this morning, if we can, if that's okay. Is it okay to have a little bit of fun on the Sabbath? Let's read through this a little bit and see if we can detect some markers. Some things that would help us to recognize and see who this, this uh, beast power is. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea. What do we know about the sea? Anybody? Where do we see that? 17 and 15. And, and he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest, were where the whore sitteth are peoples, multitudes, and nations, and tongues. So we know that this power had to have come up out of a what? A well-populated metropolis-type area. So it came up in the uh, Mediterranean area there, um, in what we refer to now as Italy and, and uh, the Middle East and that area. That's where the population of the world was at that time. Okay, what else do we see? Having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns. Now, what do these, what do these heads and horns and, and uh, crowns, what does that allude to? Well, what the heads on hills, right? It's the seven hills of Rome. Okay, yes. And then what about the horns? Well, there's the kings. Yes, where do we, where do we see that? Yes, it's Daniel 7, 17, very clearly. And then these horns have crowns on them. So what does that mean? Kingly power. It's a kingly power, absolutely. Okay. And on, the, on, on his heads, the name of blasphemy. Now, what is blasphemy? Claiming to be God and able to do what God does. Right. Yes, it's... Uh, John 7, I mean, sorry, John 10, 33, and Mark 2 and verse 7. We see the two comparisons there where Jesus was accused of being God and also accused of being able to forgive sins, which, of course, he, is God, he was God, so he was able to claim those things. And it wasn't really blasphemy, but we know we have that record to point to. So this is going to be what kind of twofold power? Religious and political. Yes. Religious and political. All right. And the beast, the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard. So, okay, so there's one type of a beast. And his feet were as the feet of a bear. So that's two. Mouth of a, of a lion. That's three. And the dragon gave him his power and seat and great authority. So we have, we actually have um, three different beasts but then we also have a dragon power as well. So, who, who could possibly that refer to? What, where else do we see that in Scripture? Daniel. Daniel 7, once again, right? We had uh, Babylon was the, the lion, and then Medo-Persia was the bear, and then, of course, Greece was the leopard. And then they had this nondescript beast, of course, which is really... The power that has received the dragon 
um, more than any uh, other authority before him. So, so he, has, he has this great power and he has a seat and great authority. But then something interesting happens. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast. What, what could this be pointing to here? Did at any point this beast power lose its power? Yeah. Well, it had the appearance. 1798. 1798. Berthier wouldn't capture the Pope. That's right. Berthier, uh, the, from the French army, instruction from Napoleon, went and captured the Pope. He died in exile. And what happened at that point? Did the crown get stripped off at that point? It did, it did lose its power originally in Italy and then throughout the world, and then the reverse is happening to get its power back. It started in Italy in 1929. Yeah, Mussolini and, then, and Gaspar. And then came back now into the world, so it's pretty much at the point of healing. And then right. clearly the, the world wonders have to be that's the final sign, and here we are. Yeah. Well, I think Mark, Mike just summed it all up. We can just go ahead and just... <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> stop right there. It just starts coming out. <laughs> No, that's perfectly, <laughs> that's perfectly fine. That's great. That's exactly right. And uh, so, yes, yeah, so um, in 1798, Berthier went in, took the Pope captive. He died in exile. They lost their sovereign country. They no longer had that, so they were no longer a monarchy. But they regained it in 29, in 1929. Mussolini and Gaspari gave it back to them. And so now, what are they? They're both a religious and a political power once again. Now, have they been fully restored mm -hmm. to their previous persecuting power? Not yet. But that wound is healing. I believe that it is. And then, of course, we can skip over to verse 7. And it says, was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. So did we see that? Did they persecute God's people? Mm -hmm. Oh, sure. Absolutely. Yes. They, they most definitely did. So this power is undoubtedly which kingdom? The kingdom of Rome, the Roman papacy power. Amen? Mm -hmm. All right. There's, there's many, many other uh, indicators, there's, and they fit every single one. For anyone to say that this power, this beast power, the first beast in Revelation 13, is any other power than the Roman papacy, they're not looking at all the indicators because and all the, the characteristics because it's just bam, 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 bam. I think there's 14, 15 of them. It's, there's a lot. So this, this power is none other than the Vatican, Rome, the papacy. And this is the seat of this beast right here. Um, and we're going to focus a little bit here on something that I have uh, seen recently that's rather... Disturbing. And, I mean, they, there's so many disturbing things, but <clears throat> this one's really in your face. It's amazing. Because, I mean, if you look at this, there's a lot of different occult symbologies and all this. And we're not going to get into all that today. Mm -hmm. But I want to focus our attention on this building right here. Very interesting shaped building. It is called Audience Hall. And um, I believe it's Pope... Uh, well, it's right here. Pope the, yes, it's Pope the Sixth, um, Audience Hall. And so this is the top of this building. Uh, if you notice, there's a curve to it, and it kind of curves around here in the front. So it raises and, and goes up and down here, and it's a very interesting uh, roof structure there. There's this odd-looking oval window here. Inside of this building is the most hideous looking what is that? sculpture this is supposed to be Christ uh, he's all kind of you know lame and not fully restored coming up from whatever this is it's, it's very demonic looking uh, here's a little bit closer up picture of this this Whatever it is, it's, it's very satanic looking to me, very gothic and, and uh, just <coughs> evil in origin completely. Very satanic, very satanic. So that is where the Pope sits, and you can see Francis sitting there right now. Now if you look from one side 
to the other. Of course, this is the stage up here. You see the supposed Jesus here. And uh, you see the oval shape here. And it's very beautiful. I mean, very beautiful, very well lit. And, of course, huge congregation. I mean, we could fit probably a thousand of these barn churches inside of that thing. Uh, maybe more, I don't know. <laughs> but, I mean, this place is really huge. Um, but this is very disturbing here. This is the front of the stage here where the Pope sits. These look very much like eyes to me. And these look very much like fangs. Fangs to me. Like a serpent. It's just like you're inside of a serpent's head. Isn't that just blatant? The way they got the, the, the lighting up there is like scales. Yep. Yes. Yes. yes, that's exactly right. It's like scales. And a matter of fact, we can look at this picture here and you kind of see the similarities of the, the scaling type um, material there on the, on the top of that building. So it's, 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 it's like in your face, we are this, this serpent power, right? This dragon power. They don't even try to hide it, but yet it's interesting... They're doing everything that they can to try to cover up their sins of the past. They're trying to do everything. They, they're trying to blame Islam for, for Islam being the Antichrist. But yet here they are. I mean, this thing is a public building that anyone can drive by and see. Um, matter of fact, this picture right here, uh, that I took right off of Google. So you can pull it up on Google and look at it. And um, it's, just, it's just really interesting. Can I take a picture of that? Which one? This yeah, one? Yeah, that one there, because I'm going to look this stuff up. Okay. That's, uh, sure. Quite insane. So, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> it's just crazy. I never it's, even seen this before. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. very, I, I, just, uh, I just stumbled across it this, this week, and I thought it was very disturbing. Yeah. Very disturbing. And how these people can even begin to say that they're not the seed of Antichrist, I, I, or try to push it away, I don't, I don't understand. So, what is this, this worship that they promote here? Okay, Sunday, like the Jew, this is a laudato say, and Sunday, like the Jewish Sabbath, is meant to be a day which heals our relationships with God. Which God are they referring to? Are they referring to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? I can't imagine. With ourselves, with others, and with the world. Rest opens our eyes to the larger picture and gives us renewed sensitivity to the rights of others. And, all, and, and so the day of rest, Sunday, is centered on the Eucharist as well. And what is the Eucharist about? It's transubstantiation, right? The, every time they have a Mass, they physically create the body, recreate the body of Christ in the wafer and in the, the wine. It's disgusting. It's absolutely disgusting. They, they keep our Savior up on the cross and uh, want, us, want Him to stay right there, dead on the cross. <coughs> because they, they ultimately, they don't profess this per se, but they hate Jesus. They have to. Uh, just by their actions, we can see that. So it sheds a lot on the whole week uh, and motivates us to greater concern for nature and the poor. I've got news. Just tending to nature and the poor is not going to save you. Okay? This, this is a form of nature worship that they're actually referring to. And it also is something that we're seeing so much right now in, our, in the world today. It's just an incredible amount of natural disasters. I believe that Satan is behind that 100%. Yes. He is trying to bring about this Sunday worship. Yes. That's, that's the impetus behind what he is trying to do. All right, so do they try to deny this fact that they have actually changed the, <coughs> the true Sabbath, the seventh-day Sabbath, to Sunday? Well, no, really they don't. Uh, prove to me from the Bible alone that I am bound to keep Sunday holy. There is no such law in the Bible. It is a law of the Holy Catholic Church alone. The Bible says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The Catholic Church says, no. By my divine power, I abolish the Sabbath day and command you to keep holy the first day of the week. And lo, the entire civilized world bows down in reverent obedience to the commandment of the Holy Catholic Church. 
Isn't that interesting? And then here, the observance of Sunday by the Protestants is an homage they pay in spite of themselves to the authority of the Catholic Church. They, they don't mince words. They're telling us exactly what they're doing. Here's more. If Protestants would follow the Bible, they should worship God on the Sabbath day, Saturday, and keeping the Sunday, they are following a law of the Catholic Church. I'm just telling you. And then Sunday, the Sunday as a day of the week set apart for the obligatory public worship of Almighty God to be sanctified by a suspension of all servile labor, trade, and worldly avocations and by exercises of devotion is purely a creation of the Catholic Church. They instituted it. So all of these religions out there that are keeping Sunday holy, what are they ultimately doing? Worshiping worship. They're setting up a form of the image, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So, who and what is this image? Once again, we'll look at Revelation um, Revelation 3, because what is an image? Is it the... It's a copy, it's a copy yes. It's not the exact the exact thing we're referring to, it's a copy of it. When we look into the mirror, do we see, is it literally ourselves in that mirror? Or is it just a reflection? It's just a reflection, right? Okay, so let's look at this, this second beast in Revelation 13 quickly. Revelation 13, 11. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. So this one didn't come up out of the sea. It came up out of a more destitute area. I wonder what nation that could be. What power that could be? USA. We are a world power like none other. We are not only a world power, but we're founded on Protestant beliefs, right? We used to be anyway. Yeah. So, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. So there we have it. What is a lamb? A symbol of? Yeah, the Lamb of, the lamb of, the, uh, of God to take away the sin of the world, right? And, but he also spake as a dragon. So what are we seeing here? It's a, it's, once again, it's going to be an image of a religious and a political power. I mean, ultimately, that's what it's going to be. It's going to be the combination of church and state. Amen? Are, are you with me? Yes. Okay, so what is the dragon that he's speaking like? It's the first beast, right? It's, it's the... It's, it's the, the power that's behind the first beast, okay? And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. So what is this a reference back to? It's referencing back to verse 3, right? This, same, this is the power. This is the image here, the likeness that we're taking on. And uh, we can carry, carry on a little bit more. And he gave power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. So this second power we have already identified, we believe, is the United States. It's going to have great power to be able to promote this image to the point that everyone will be forced to make a decision between worshiping the true Lord and Savior and the false. Amen? And what's going to happen? He's going to cause all both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, so nobody's going to have a free pass or an excuse, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that hath the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. So, this is a time that's right upon us. And, you know, so many, so many people will say, well, that can't happen in America. There's no way that's going to happen in America. This is a, this is a, loving, a loving country, you know. We, we uh, equal rights and all these different things, <laughs> and freedom of religion and different uh, laws set up, you know, separation of church and state, these types of things that uh, our country has instituted from its beginning. But what are we seeing within our country as far as the religious entities that are here, the Protestant 
denominations. Well, as we've seen before, they have united. The word united, united, means that they are united with, back with Rome. That's what, that's what that means when they're talking about being united back to Rome. And what about, what about our country now? We have, we have a wonder, wonderful new president who has vowed to, to give Christians more power, and Donald Trump, but he's also vowed to close the gap between church and state. He's also talking about tearing down, I mean, sorry, uh, yes, tearing down the wall between church and state. We've heard that quoted as well. Um, he recently declared a national day of prayer on Sunday, of course. And Trump hoping to use first foreign trip to unite religious religions against extremism. And what is extremism? We've talked about this before. People don't go along with the program. Yes, and people that are fundamentalist. Believe and what are fundamentalists? The they believe in the Bible, the authority of the Bible, and the Bible owned, so, uh, only, uh, solo scriptura, just like Martin Luther and the, all the different reformers, the Waldensians we just talked about this morning. So, is this right? Should he be, should he be following that type of an agenda? No, absolutely not. This should be a separation between the church and state. That's what this country was founded upon. But it seems like he's talking just like the Pope. He said, fight extremism and fund fundamentalism. Religions to join forces in the fight against fundamentalism and extremism is urged by the Pope. And this one is very disturbing here. This is uh, the Vatican Insider. Religious, religious dis distortions, yes, for example, all religions have fundamentalist groups. All of them, we do too. So the Roman Catholic Church, they say they have some too. And they destroy, starting from their fundamentalism, the belief in the solo scriptura, but these are small religious groups that have distorted and have sickened. So you're sick if you believe in the Word of God and want to live by the standards of the Word of God only and not to some, some post or uh, some uh, pope or some prelate. Their religion, and as, as a result, they fight, they wage war, or they cause division in communities, which is a form of war. Interesting. And he says, it's always, there's always these, it's a small group. That should, that should clue him in right there. Mm -hmm. The Bible says the remnant. Wow. It's the remnant of her seed that's going to be saved. He needs to get on the right side. Amen. Amen. As do all of us. These three angels' messages to warn the people about this deception that is running so rampantly, even amongst our own people, God's chosen people, if you will, the remnant people, the proclamation of the first, second, and third angels' messages has been located by the word of inspiration. Not a peg or pen is to be removed. It's not supposed to be changed in any way. No human authority has any more right to change the location of these messages than to substitute the New Testament for the Old. The Old Testament is the gospel in figures and symbols. The New Testament is the substance. One is as essential as the other. Very important. A more definite work even. More definite than the medical missionary work. This was, a, this was a, a rebuke to uh, Kellogg, who was putting more effort and energy into the sanitarium work than he was into spreading the three angels' messages. And so she's telling him that, you know, the medical missionary work is good, but there's a more definite work, more, more definite and very important. We need to make sure that we're addressing. In special lines was beginning, was being neglected that you were gathering into your arms a class of work that is never ending, which was eclipsing the work that needs to be done in every city. The proclamation of the soon coming of Christ, the third angel's message was being blanketed, covered up. It's a life and death, death question. Very, very important, these three angels' messages. We know that now everything is at stake. The third angel's message is to be, at this time, regarded as of the highest importance. It doesn't get any more important than the three angel's messages. It is a life and death question. If we knew 
how many souls are hanging in the balance that we could do something to reach with this most precious and important message for our time. If we could see uh, beyond the realm of, of our, our uh, sphere and what we can see and see into the other world to see what's going on behind the scenes in this great controversy and know exactly how hard Satan is doing everything that he can to subdue this message and tone it down and push it aside and totally eradicate it and abolish it completely even among God's remnant people. We would, I, I would pray that any, if any of us had any heart for lost souls out there that we would stand up and fight against this. We're in a war. It's not a war that we fight with, with guns and swords, uh, uh, but our Bible, our Bible sword. I mean, yes, Mike, you had a comment? I had a discussion with a friend at church yesterday over the phone, and I was sharing with this individual uh, because they'd asked me what my plans were for today. And sometimes they'll invite me to the house for lunch. Right. And I said, well, I have a full day event. He says, oh, well, what are you doing? Um, and I said, well, I'm coming up to the barn, ball ground, and having lunch, stuff like that. And, and then I started talking about why I come up here and what's, what's the ministry about. <coughs> and some of the three angels message, what you're talking about right here, being blanketed and, and suppressed up like that. And the, the person, the individual, uh, used a quote from Ellen White, and you all know it probably very well, is that the uh, Christ and his righteousness is the three angels' message in verity. And so... Justification by I, faith. I, is. I, I, asked, I asked this person, I said, okay... I totally understand what you're saying regarding Christ and his righteousness. I said that's the foundation. However, if that is the three, three angels' message, then what is this warning in Revelation 14? Right. Uh, because it's been mentioned to me by this person before to, to the point where it almost seems like that is the three angels' message, that is what we're supposed to be preaching, and right. nothing's being talked about this, this warning over here. And I said, I said, you're talking about Christ and his righteousness, and I'm not denying that. Right. But when you exclude it... From the eternal gospel, which in Revelation 14 in the beginning says this is the eternal gospel, it's part <coughs> of it. And so it's this dumbing down. It's being weakened down yes. to the point where it's like it's just Christ is righteous, the love of God, the love of God, the love of God. And it just it, it saddens me that this because this individual loves, like believes in the spirit of prophecy, believes the Bible, loves the Lord. Right. And now that I think about it, I never in our conversations really hear him talking about the three angels' message. Right. Well, even if they do talk about three angels' message, like for instance, our General Conference President, Ted Wilson. Mm -hmm. He talks about the three angels' messages, but we I just received a new Adventist review, uh -huh. I believe is the magazine that it was, or Adventist Today, one of the two, and he always has a, 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 an article in there. And again, once again, he talked about the three angels' messages. Guess what he quoted? The first angel's message. That's all he ever quotes is the first angel's message that I've seen. He never gets into calling the papacy, you know, the... the uh, Babylon and, and uh, the Antichrist and all those things. He doesn't get into that. He keeps it on a love of God type of message. The 18th chapter of Revelation reveals the importance of presenting the truth in no measure terms, but with boldness, with power, there must be no toning down of the truth. Amen. Can we read that any other way? Does no mean no? It means no toning down. It needs to be voiced more openly and louder. No muffling of the message for this time. Satan has devised a state of things whereby the proclamation of the third angel's message shall be bound about. You see, that's the work of Satan. To hush it. To bind it up. Discard it. We must beware of his plans and methods. The third angel's message is to be strengthened and confirmed. Are we confirming it here today? Are we seeing? We're going to even more. Don't, don't worry. Satan will so mingle his deceptions with the truth that side issues will be created to turn the attention. Man, is he doing that. And is he, is he doing just a fabulous job at it too. Uh, turn the attention of the people from the great issue, the test to be brought upon the people of God in these last days. Okay, so what is it that makes a church become Babylon. One that ends up falling in to this Babylonian state. Well, Satan would exalt to have the message go broadcast that only the people whom God has made the repositories of his law, so we're not supposed to keep it just within Seventh-day Adventism, right? 
It needs to be, it needs to be um, spread abroad, right, to the whole world. The wine of Babylon is the exalting of the false and spurious Sabbath above the Sabbath. Okay? So that's number one. Which the Lord Jehovah hath blessed and sanctified. That's the fourth commandment for the use of man. Also, it is the immortality of the soul. That's two. What is that also called? Spiritualism, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Spiritualism. These kindred heresies and the rejection of the truth, there's three, convert the church into Babylon. Kings, merchants, rulers, and religious teachers are all in corrupt harmony. Are we not seeing Revelation 18 come to fruition today? All the merchants of the earth, everyone working together to unite the world under the spurious Sabbath. But you see those, those three characteristics. Well, Thankfully, we're Seventh-day Adventists, and so we're, we're immune to all of those possibilities, right? Mm -hmm. Are we seeing any of these things in our church? Heaven forbid, aren't we? Yeah, there's Sunday worship in a form. We... Friends, this, 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 this does not uh, pleasure me in any way to expose these things that are happening within our Seventh-day Adventist church. But I have a great burden on my heart to make sure that, that people are warned of these terrible dangers. And I have been told that these things don't apply to us. Because, for instance, spiritualism. That it doesn't apply to us because we've never believed in immediate the immortality of the soul. We've never believed that. So therefore these deceptions don't apply to us and we're exempt as Seventh-day Adventists. My friend, that is ridiculous. That is absolutely, absolutely serpent language is what that is. Were any of God's people at any point in time throughout history ever exempt from sin? No. If we fall into sin, we bear the consequences. Amen? Period. That's Satan's MO is to try to get us to sin. That's right. He beats on me every day. You have to endure the temptation. That's right. That's all we can do. He's warring against us, the, the, the commandment keepers of, of the Lord, more than anyone else. Ultimately. That's just, that's just incredible. But Mike, you're absolutely right, brother. We are seeing within Seventh-day Adventism that people within Seventh-day Adventism are keeping Sunday rather than Saturday. Or in addition to, it says right here, um, the Sunday service is going to be a first point of contact for the unchurched in the community and for the people who, for whatever reason, beliefs, work, can't come on Saturday. Did the Fourth Commandment say that it's okay if you need to go to work? That you can skip? No. We're not supposed to work on the Sabbath. Keeping it holy. We have communicated to the conference and because they wanted clarity on this, but once we communicated the purpose to them, they saw that it is not a big deal. Not a big deal. Now, is the church at large embracing Sunday worship? No. Is Roy standing up here saying that, that the church is Babylon? No, I'm not. Okay? I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is, I'm seeing trends. I'm seeing trends in that direction. You see, we're, we're, you see the church moving toward the yes. Babylon. Whether, the, whether or not they will fully embrace it, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not even going to say they're going to at some point. I'm not going to say that. They very well could. They're certainly trending in that direction. And to be honest, it breaks my heart and it, yes. and it saddens me. Yes. Because I love those people. Mm -hmm. I love the people in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I love all people for that matter. And I don't want anyone to be lost by this deception or, or any other. This is a very startling statement coming from this man right here. The universe equals God equals pantheism, equals spiritualism. Look at what pantheism is. A doctrine identifying the deity with the universe, with, with the universe and its phenomenon. Belief in and, and, in and worship of what? Gods. All gods. Zero desire to talk to the universe. To further confirm, he says, God says, talk to me. Let me see if I can get this to work here. And because I want you to be a witness. You were involved in the hot zone of sin. 
and it's going on. You have absolutely zero desire to talk to the universe at all. Why? It's just been shut off. Sin has just cut the communication ties, and you no longer want to even talk. God, so talk to me. Just say the word. I'm in there. God says, talk to me. Say the word. I'm in there. He refers to the universe. That we have zero desire, and I think it's interesting he's doing the 666 symbols, zero desire to talk to the universe. And who is this man? Anyone know? Mm -mm. You guys don't know who this man is. I know who he is. I can think of his name. Can we see his face, but I don't remember his name. This is, this is Dwight Nelson. Nelson yeah. oh. Dwight Nelson, of course, is the senior pastor at um, Andrews University. And what is Andrews University? Andrews University is our flagship university with the, with the uh, seminary, also known as the cemetery. And <clears throat> for good reason. <laughs> you see why it's referred to as the cemetery? If you go there to, to glean this kind of theology and understanding, this man is also recorded as saying that Allah is the same as our God. He also says that. And believe it or not, if you want to stay at, if you want to make sure you stay after, I can show you those, those clips as well. But I couldn't believe it. The Carter, John Carter, Carter Report, also says the same thing, that Allah is God, the same God. So we're not only seeing Sunday worship coming into our denomination, we're also seeing pantheism and spiritualism. Pantheism and spiritualism, they believe, you know what pantheism is, right? It's, it's, it's believing that God is in everything. It's in the universe, as he says. It's in everything. That's spiritualism, guys. Mm -hmm. So what were the two things? The three things the Spirit of Prophecy said? She said, exalting the, Sabbath, the Sunday Sabbath and the immortality of the soul and rejection of the truth. Are we seeing that? Mm -hmm. It's scary, folks. It's scary. I'm just, I'm blown away at the times in which we're living. And we need to be awake. We need to so be awake. And of course, the majority of the pastors, they're not saying anything about these things. No vision, we die. Proverbs 28, 18, where there is no vision, the people perish. What would, what would, would be referring to here in the vision? What, what, who gets visions? Prophets. 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 Prophets get vision. So where there's no vision, where we throw out our prophets... The people perish. Mm -hmm. Are we doing that today? Yes. This is all wrong, guys. All wrong. William Johnson, editor of the Adventist Review in 9495, Saints, Saints' Victory in the End Time, to in interpret the sea monster of Revelation 13, which we were just talking about, as the papacy seems somewhat out of keeping with the spirit of the times. Okay? So... We don't need to look at things as people did back in the 18th century or the 19th century. We need to look at things from our perspective of today because obviously the Word of God and the spirit of prophecy changes with, needs to change with the times. That's what they're saying, right? In an age when Christianity in general faces the onslaughts of secularism and when among Christians ecumenism has become popular, the interpretation smacks of narrowness and bigotry. Narrowness and bigotry. Where do we see this narrowness and bigotry so strongly? We're just talking about this one. We're just talking about it in the Great Controversy. This is a narrow, bigot, bigoted book right here. We should, we should throw this thing away, according to them. According to this man. Who? Editor. Adventist Review. And, uh, and who, what are they? they're calling the Holy Spirit and our prophet. They're calling the Word of God. Ultimately, it's the Word of God too. It's in, it's in Revelation 13. It's clear who this beast is. They're, said, they're calling the Holy Spirit. That's blaspheming the Holy Spirit right there. Man. Of course, we're probably most 
familiar with this, most of us. This is uh, the, the uh, past president of the General Conference in a court, in a courtroom. And he was the vice president at the time he said this. And, but in a courtroom, he has, has now been consigned talking about the, um, the, the church's attitude towards the Roman Catholic Church, and it's changed over time, and now it, all this needs to be consigned to the historical trash heap as so far as the Seventh-day Adventist Church is concerned. Well, I don't want to have that thrown in the trash heap, right? He was, you know, you would think that this man was demoted and fired and excommunicated. But he was the vice president when he said this, and then he became the president. That's, that's Ted's dad, right? Yeah. That's Ted Wilson's dad. And now Ted Wilson is the president. Following the same lead. Oh, man, interesting. Now... Hang on to your seats. This next one is, will blow your doors off. <clears throat> there is another universal and truly Catholic organization, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, Neil Wilson. Now, I, 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 people, people will argue against me and say that, well, Catholic just means universal. Okay, well, he's talking, he's talking like a child then because he says another universal and truly universal organization. That makes no sense. No sense at all. But he says the Seventh-day Adventist Church is another Catholic organization. You know what? He's probably really telling the truth. Mm -hmm. And that was in 1981. Friends, I have looked at some huge comparisons of quotes between the Roman Catholic Church and the Seventh-day Adventist Church over the years. It's frightful. It breaks my heart. It totally breaks my heart. Just unbelievable. George Vanderman, um, probably familiar with him. Uh, he, he had his television show for many years there. I used to, I used to wake up every Sunday morning and watch that show. Uh, I really liked George Vanderman. So I, when I saw this, I was flabbergasted by it. I'm flabbergasted because I thought he was all good. Yeah. These were the dark ages for the church. How could Christians be so intolerant of their brothers and sister in Christ? Are Roman Catholics... The, 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 leader, any, the leaders of the Roman Catholic, the priests and the, and the prelates and the Pope and all them, are they, do they know that, who they're really worshiping? Christ? Are we really brothers and sisters in Christ no. with them? They're, they're worshiping a different Christ. You saw the picture just a few minutes ago, this awful, hideous image. Jesus predicted that those who killed his followers would sincerely think that they were serving God. It is not for us to question our medieval ancestors, nor must we overlook the good done by the church. They've done so much good through this medieval age. They slaughtered millions of Christians. Throughout the world, monasteries provided care for orphans, orphans widow, widows, and the sick. And all of us owe appreciation to the church of the Middle Ages for preserving the scriptures. <laughs> We just talked about that from the Waldensians chapter this morning. D does Rome get the credit for that? Sounds like it. Church <laughs> Should the Rome get the, the credit for that? Absolutely not, never, friends. Never. Absolutely not. Rome did everything it could to destroy it. It was only by the hand of God that it was saved and preserved. Amen. I believe that fully and completely. If it had been up, I mean, this is, this is a power that is given to it by none other than the dragon himself. Do you, think, do you think Satan loves the scriptures? No, he hates them. He wants to destroy it forever. Because he knows that if we lose the scripture, we lose the word of God, then we'll be lost. Associate editor of the Review, Myron Winmer. I was surprised and delighted to learn that the Bible is the sole textbook during the Pope's visit and the World Youth Day activities. What a wonderful opportunity from so many young people to for so many young people to hear the gospel message straight from God's word. Talking about the Pope. Well, read he's reading from the Word of God. Really wonder what he's reading about. You think he's talking about the the beast in Revelation 13, 17, 14, this mark? <coughs> or might a better understanding be that God is working through this Pope to open doors for Catholics, to the great truths of Scripture, which, you know, to a certain degree, you know, God always does use horrible things to His good. 
concerning salvation by faith in Christ, I can only wonder if in these last days he is using some very unexpected sources to encourage, encourage many individuals, especially Catholics, especially Catholics, in search for truth. They're going to get the truth from the man who claims to be the vicar of Christ, God on earth. Mercy. Uh, Samuel Bakayoki. We're familiar with this man, I'm sure. He was a Jesuit plant. We have pictures of him in his Jesuit robes and all of this stuff. I don't understand how he became such a prominent man within our Seventh-day Adventist organization, but he was highly respected and still is today. He's passed away now. Highly respected, highly regarded, and uh, loved by our denomination, and our leadership in the denom denomination as a whole. But he says right here, the preceding analysis of the identifying marks of the prophetic antichrist represented in Daniel 7 by the imagery of the little horn and in Revelation 13 by the symbol of the beast has shown that both the papacy and Islam fulfill the qualifying marks of this prophetic power. Can somebody please tell me how in the world Islam fulfills that all of those identifying marks that we looked at some of today? Zero. Persecuting Christians? Sure, I'll give you that one. But to, to be, to be um, a four-part beast, having the, the, the uh, lion and the bear and the, the leopard, and it's, it's not there, friends, not there. <clears throat> Ellen White, in, in uh, Great Controversy, page 439, over 90 times identifies the papacy as the beast in Revelation 13, 1 through 10. Mm. In chapter 13, is described another beast, likened to a leopard, to which the dragon gave his power and his seat and great authority. This symbol, as most Protestants have believed, but somehow they are disregarding, represents the papacy, which succeeding to the power and seat and authority once held by the ancient Roman Empire. Of the leopard-like beast, it is declared... There was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God and to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. This prophecy, which is nearly identical with the description of the title the little, I'm sorry, the description of the little horn of Daniel 7 unquestionably points to the papacy. No question. No, no hesitation whatsoever there. That's who it's pointing to. And all of these men who are supposed to be Seventh-day Adventists want to either throw this wonderful truth into the garbage or they want to completely deny it and denounce it and still claim to be Christians and Seventh-day Adventist Christians today. Well, who, who will be the redeemed? Who will receive the victory? And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. That's the group I want to be a part of. Amen? Amen. You, can, you can do whatever you want to to this body. I'll get a new one. I'll get a better one. I'm not worried about this body. It's, yes, it's difficult. It's not pleasant. It's not something that we want to think about, that we may be tortured or, or uh, <clears throat> have to witness our, our dear loved ones being tortured. But we just have to remember that we just need to forbear it a little while. Mm -hmm. And then he that has promised that he will come, he will come and he will save us. And this was our scripture reading for, the, for today. Let's all read it together. And I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God, 
And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Revelation 15, 2 and 3. I want to be there on the sea of glass, and I want to see each and every one of you there as well. I pray that that is our prayer, each one of us today, as we continue to live in this world, in the 11th hour of this world, I believe. I believe we're in the 11th hour. We are, we are in the final moments of this world's history. And we don't have a lot of time. But uh, thankfully, the Lord is so long-suffering mm -hmm. and loving and merciful that even though we've messed up and we've not jumped when we could have and should have, if we plead for forgiveness, He will still accept our offering and I believe that, that He will accept our offering and that we can still do a great work for Him and hear those wonderful words, well done, my good and faithful servant. Amen.